So after last week's successful trip to Cars and Coffee on the dock in Liverpool, I've decided to crack on and tick off a few more of those jobs on the Lotus Elite. So first up, let's change that oil and filter. Well, that smells of fuel, so it was definitely due. And whilst I'm down the pit, I'm going to take the opportunity to have a good look at this chassis and see its condition. Now these wells here are normally the first things to go. It's where water accumulates and they eventually rot out. I mean, the surface rust, which is clearly evident. But looking at these closely and looking at the rest of the chassis, most of it is surprisingly solid. So it's out with that side on oil filter. And in with the Lotus one with that special valve that keeps the filter full of oil when the car is sitting still. And it's in with some quality 2050 oil. Check the level. And we're good to go. And now I'm going to move on to that cam belt. Now, as I've explained before, it's recommended that these are changed at regular intervals every three years, or I think it's every 20 or 30,000 miles, which is quite soon, but you better just follow the rules and you've got peace of mind. Even though Tom assures me he put a brand new one on and the car's never run since, these can deteriorate over time. So, let's get it done. And although this bonnet's fiberglass and quite light, it's still no fun doing it on your own. So it's out with the shield for easy access. Then out with the number one spark plug. Off with the alternator belt. And as to the cam belts, as I compare them, the Gates one that's already on compared to the Lotus one, even though the video doesn't show it, you can see it's slightly thicker and more robust. And I'm turning the engine clockwise. I insert a screwdriver into the number one plug hole. And all your marks are lined up. Top dead centre. Both pulleys lined up. Also check the reverse mark, which it has on this. Now I know there's two marks, but the previous owners marked them in red, so they line up. And the mark on the back of the distributor pulley, which is also lined up himself with the edge of this aluminium. Then you can feel with the screwdriver that the piston is at the top of its stroke. I don't know what these lines are for on the belt, but they seem to line up with the marks on the pulleys. But I'm going by the marks that I know. Undo the tensioner. Now, I'm gonna be a little bit controversial here. I've had this round twice now, and I've checked and double checked this belt. And as far as I'm concerned, it's literally brand new. So I'm gonna take the decision, I'm gonna leave this on. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying that's me, and that's my prerogative. But the belt was always a little bit sloppy. So I'm gonna make sure it's tensioned up properly. I'm also going to take this opportunity to put a new alternator belt on, because this one's stretched.
And as I've said, although this is a bit of a pain and not exactly ideal removing and replacing a bonnet on your own, it just reminds me of years ago when I was working on a Pagoda SL. Even though that bonnet was light, because it was aluminium, it was also spring-loaded. And I was doing it in a 24-scale wind. <laughs> that certainly wasn't fun. So with that done, I'm going to take the car on its longest journey yet. So I'm going to pop over to Chris Foles over in Huddersfield to see what he thinks of the underneath and to get an appraisal from a true expert. And of course, typical spring weather in the UK. First thing we're going to look at yeah. is the chassis because typically they are bad for corrosion. Watch your eyes. Yeah. Looks a bit thin, doesn't it? Yeah, we've got a problem there. If you look up there, can you see where it's. Oh, yeah. See where it's starting to go through there? Yeah, it's very thin. Now, I got it up a few days ago and I noticed. The shock was basically pissing out. It yep. was pissing fluid, you know. I mean, the shocks look like they've been there since the car was new, don't they? Look at the state <laughs> of this one as well. Stone Age, that, isn't it? These were Armstrong shocks originally, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. And I believe Colin Chapman at Lotus was so meticulous and fastidious, he used to drive the mad at Armstrong because he used to check through so many and go, yeah, that's the right one, or these aren't yep. the right ones. Yeah. And each car was individual and hand-built, so, yeah. So are we going for aftermarket ones on that? <laughs> <laughs> what about these? These... These are seatbelt mount brackets. Yeah, brackets. yeah, the things that are rotted away. So that's, that's not structural, yeah. but... They're yeah, we do we're pulling that off. Yeah. To be honest, they're not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite happy with well, it. I mean, they've got a lot of surface corrosion. Yeah, but it'll buzz off and it'll clean can, up you and you can, can paint that. them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, there's a new caliper on the left there and there's an old one on the right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you might not do both of them. You typically want to do things in pairs. Yeah. Especially with the brakes. We've got some corrosion on this arm here. Oh yeah, I can see that. That's, uh, I actually saw that when I first bought the car and I thought, not that very... doesn't look too hot. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's strictly an MOT failure, is that? And these fit through here, yeah? Yeah, just yeah. a bolt through there, yeah. anti-roll bar. Yeah, anti-roll bar, yeah. you'd do a new one of them, couldn't I? No, the bar's okay, the bar's... Yeah, but look, look at the play in them. We've got play in the bushes. Yeah. And typically, these bushes here are gone. Mm. But the bar itself, yeah, when some, you take the bushes off, we'll be okay. Yeah, but sometimes when you spend a week, you know, buzzing the bar off and painting it and all the rest of it to look nice, <laughs> yeah, probably best just buying a new one. That's up to you. Yeah. What about these, Steve? Don't they go here? The chassis at the front is just has just got surface corrosion. Yeah. There's, there's I'm no... surprised. I thought these would be rotted through, but the, all the wells are all intact and it all just looks yeah. like surface rust, like you say. Yeah, no, it's all surface corrosion on there. Little bit of a leak on the rack there. The rack boot's split, isn't it? The track rod ends actually look new, don't they? But they look so corroded on the surface. See the rubber on that looks like brand new, doesn't it? Yeah, they've been on a long time though. Yeah, yeah. you can say that again. <laughs> Chris was saying before, Steve, that these bolts as well need to be taken out every so often and cleaned up and greased up and put back together again because yeah. they tend to seize. And I was saying to him, I remember the Scimitar GTE had a similar thing. 
it was a similar design, you know, and every 3,000 miles or so, you had to do the same thing. And it, yeah. was, it was just a really bad design. Not if you enjoy working on the car. But I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Now the hard part is with the chassis, you can't see on the top edge of the chassis and there's foam on there. Can you see this foam? Yeah. That absorbs the moisture. Right, and that's where the rot sets in. And, it's, and it sets in, yeah. Yeah. Plenty of mud under there. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, the Porsche was the same, it was caked in mud. Ooh. Oof. Ooh. Oof. Ooh. Yeah. I'd say that was on par with the worst I've ever seen, but it's a different setup on these, isn't it? We haven't got to the other side yet. Okay. <laughs> but it is a different setup, isn't it? So it does look worse than it is. I know that's bad. Well, they don't have an upper suspension arm, and it uses the drive shaft as the upper suspension arm. So if the arm. UJs are worn out. So if you get any wear in the universal joints, yeah. and the wheel bearing tends to suffer. Mm. And you get that play. So that plays in, your, in universal joints and your wheel bearing. Yeah. Scary really, isn't it? Because there's no real telltale sign when you're driving the car, because the car drives nice. Typically, it's only when you get it up like this and you, you yeah. examine it, it's, it's Typically, quite scary, isn't you it? You can tell if, you, if the top end of the wheel leans in quite a lot. You can see it when it's sat stationary. Yeah. Well, they are kind of like that, bad. aren't they? They are naturally Didn't slightly. That was tracking all negative what? camber, yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them are quite bad. Unfortunately, you're going to need some universal joints and and some wheel bearings in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. So they're the two most common problems yeah. with one of these, is the chassis and the suspension. So it's, it's body off really, isn't it? To repair that yeah. and to do it right, yes. So the chassis at the front is yeah. quite strong. All we've got there is surface corrosion. Yeah. We've got surface corrosion on the brake pipes, but the chassis is the main thing. It's quite strong. Which I'm quite surprised yeah. at. It's, it, uh, it often looks worse than it is with the surface rust, doesn't it? For a car of this age, it's, it's not, not bad at all. Yeah. You said it, it's not a galvanised chassis. Could do with a full set of shocks and springs, I think. Yeah. And everything grind them back and clean them up. Because over time, the springs, they will sag. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I just had one snap on a BMW, the front one, while it was stationary in the driveway. It went right through the tyre. I mean, they're not like, they're not made like they used to. I know it's an old uh, adage, but no. And the vertical link and trunnion's good. Yeah. Which will save you a few pounds. Do they need to be greased up? So every, every time we service one, there's, yeah. there's a grease nipple there. That wants to be greased. And typically we put gear oil in. Yeah. Rather than grease. Really? Yeah. What does the gearbox take in terms of oil? 75, 90. The only thing that's badly corroded at the front is the suspension at the bottom. Yeah. That lower one there, yeah. the lower arm. It's very thin. Yeah. I'll load a new one of them. I'll load the one for both sides, I think. I'll just go right through the lot. Yeah. I mean, it's best to be safe and sorry, isn't it? Yeah. The list is getting bigger, Chris. Throttle cable. Yeah. You'll have to put your bracket back to how it was oh, previously. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a bit, a bit of a Frankie's <laughs> monster, as we say. And the new fuel line and oh, great. Because all mine are frayed and yeah. botched up. And, and well, it's, the, it's crucial because it's on top of the, the um, distributor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it can drip it fuel can, can and drip it's, it's like a fuel potential down, fire hazard. And rubber is being affected by modern fuel. Of course it is, yeah. I never thought it's about that. Causing a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah, in the carburetors as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's terrible stuff. It's mainly with rubber bits, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we've been through it quite comprehensively today. Yeah, um, Steve's got a list. Yeah, you're going <coughs> to... I'll get, get the list together me. on Monday. Yeah. Do, you, do you want me to price it up for you or just... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Price it up. Price uh, it up and some of the availability and how yeah. long it'll take and that. Yeah. And I'll then when it all arrives in, just if you could post yeah. it out to me or yeah. I can come and get it with yeah, you. It's not a problem. Yeah, but there's quite a few bits to get, there isn't is. it? <laughs> but you were saying before, it's all the usual bits that go on these cars, isn't it? You weren't surprised to see any of it? Not at all. I mean, I could have written that list out before you came. Yeah. If you'd said I've got an elite and it's original, yeah. I, could, I could have virtually written that list. But Chris, there was a few things that I was surprised at. I thought the front suspension, I know like the lower arm went, it was gone on one side. Yeah. But the front, the front bits where all the wells are, I thought all them would have been gone, but they were all pretty... You've, you've been lucky in that respect because quite often you would get failures in that yeah. area. But the critical area is that back cross member. Yeah. And because it corrodes from the top where the, the sound deadening body is, off. you can't see it, so yeah. you've got to take the body off. Yeah. Well, you can advise me on how to take oh, the body off when I get to that point. Chief, yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris, right. top man. Thanks okay, again. then. Really Cheers. appreciate it. See you later. See you later. But before I take leave, I managed to talk Chris into showing me their age old method for tuning customers' cars using an original antique mercury filled manometer. But first, he checks the car's timing. What's the timing setting to these, Steve? 10, 10 degrees. Before or after? Before. So that's currently running at 16 degrees. That's why that's six out, innit? Smell nice, these old cars, don't they? Yeah, damp. <laughs> what are you doing now, Steve? You turn the distributor? Yeah, I'm going to try and adjust the timing. Advancing by, it, yeah. By, or by it. Yeah. Exactly that. That's now set to 10 degrees. Yeah. This is where we put the adapter for the manometer. Right. Pulls the vacuum. Like 10 railings in place. What's all this? I'm getting everything so it's set to a neutral position. So, yeah. so when we start adjusting, we know we're set going from a, this is a nice starting point. Yeah. I was amazed when Chris told me that you, you start about, is it five and a half? Normally you, you get it to around the five and a half mark. I start these at these. Yeah. They're, I start them at six. Yeah. You see, it, when I did the weathers, I started half at, turns. I think it was one and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, half turns? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was uh, not even three half turns. I set them out as a starting point. Yeah. But these come out an awful lot more, don't they? So the idea is we want these as level as we can get them. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. It's really levelling up, isn't it? It's almost there. So you're going into Richin and out to Lean. Mm. Quite crucial, they're quite small. Oh, yeah, you have to kind of yeah. adjust them and wait. Tiny little yeah, adjustments. Yeah. That's looking good. It's lower than I'd like. Yeah. But wouldn't you, like, compensate for that with your... Um, your idle screw. Yeah. Just give it a minute just to kind of settle down. Let it settle, yeah. Yeah. What I would suggest now is yeah. we're getting it somewhere fairly close. Yeah. Because we'll go on a road test and then put it Clear back the on plugs. here. Yeah. And see what it what it's doing. Yeah. We don't know what the internals of the engine are like. Mm -hmm. You know, what are your compressions, what are your valves sitting like. We need to make yeah, sure everything else is yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So you start with the time and then this and then you check everything You've got else. To start with your ignition time yeah. first, yeah. Now can you see these plates between the carburetor and yeah, the inlet manifold? Yeah. They have O-rings in there. Yeah. And it should be more flexibly mounted than this. See how it's over tightened? Yeah. 
And the idea of that is so the cabrets have got movement. Yeah, well, that's, that's my fault then. Yeah, I've just over tightened them. And I've learned that nothing should be over tightened, just nipped up on these. You might have to undo it. <laughs> yeah, I will do. The problem you've got is that the O-rings might now need replacing. Yeah, well, that's yeah. easy enough. Yeah. I'd ideally like it to come down faster yeah. than the revs. That little so pop, was, it, was that telling you that it was a little bit lean, the mixture? That pop yeah. is because you've got an air leak on your exhaust and it's drawing oh, air right. in. And it's popping, you can hear it. Now, one of the reasons it's not coming down as fast is Could because... Be this, because it needs a return spring. Yeah. Bring your throttle up that. See what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. As in it's hold it, it's not allowing it to come back. Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. Have you got one? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we can get one. And with that done, and what's been the most enjoyable afternoon, before the night draws in, I decide to make tracks. Okay, so I'm just on my way back and the car just isn't happy. It's um, it's slightly overheating, which it wasn't on the way down. Uh, and we sat in quite a bit of traffic on the way down. Um, but I think what it was, the timing was set at 16 degrees before top dead centre. And Steve thought it was probably better at 10. That was the normal setting. So he shifted the timing and, and then he's basically gunned the carburettors into that particular time and I think it just cocked everything up. I think the time and market was on 16 degrees before it was probably done by Tom, the previous owner, to take into consideration the new fuel and just balance everything up and just advance it a little bit. Uh, it just seemed much happier at that setting so I think tomorrow I'll start fiddling about and tweaking it and maybe put it back to maybe not 16, maybe 14 degrees, just advance it that little bit and I think it'll make all the difference. I mean, it's not overheating, but I mean, it's quite a few degrees over what it was coming down. So I can tell, you can just feel it. You can, you know, you can feel how rough it's running. So uh, it's just trial and error really, isn't it? But we tried. Okay, so here we are, it's the next day. Like I said last night, the car just wasn't happy. It wasn't performing as it should. Um, I, I've had it running much nicer before then. And it's no detriment to Steve. I mean, he's a really good mechanic and he used all the proper old school gear, which was, you know, a real treat for us to see how he set up these carburettors and that. But remember, he said the timing was set at 16 degrees before top dead centre and there was a mark there. I think Tom was very astute and he's done a lot of work on this car. And I think... I think there's a lot to be said for people who know the cars. If they've worked with them for a while and they've kind of got to know the car and its idiosyncrasies and its, its little nuances, whatever, you kind of know what's best for your car, like you do for your kids. And, you know, I just think, no detriment to Steve, but I think if he had more than an hour on the job, which is all he had, he had to get off, um, he probably would have followed the job through and got it running nice and realised that the timing settings, I think, at 16 degrees before top dead, top dead centre are probably about right because it's where the car felt happy and it was nice and smooth and the mixture all seemed great and that. So it was just spluttering and just not happy at all. Just just, just felt like laboured, it felt rich um, and it wasn't smooth at all. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna gun it in again. I'm gonna take it back up to say 14, see how it feels. And then if it's still not quite happy, I'll take it back to the 16 that I've had it running happily on. And then um, we'll just take it from there. So let's see how we go.
that sound much better to me. I forgot to mention when I was there yesterday, both Chris and Steve slaughtered me for not changing the timing belt. So, while it's all off and the bonnet's off and everything's out the way, I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to do it, even just for peace of mind. So it's off with the crankshaft pulley. Off with the tension on the belt. It's like Groundhog Day, this. Round to top dead centre, checking all your marks. All good. And off it comes. Cool, it looks like dirty dishwater. Careful to keep the tension at the bottom. And on it goes. Tension back on. Yep, I'm happy with that. Check all your marks are still lined up. this should be pointing to the bottom lock it up all good top it up with some nice fresh antifreeze yeah I'm happy with that okay well, that's all done and we've now got the agonizing task of starting the engine and please god don't let me be a couple of cogs out and the engine smashes to bits <laughs> now look I've, I've had it round a couple of times i've double checked all my marks they're all absolutely spot on so um yeah let's give it a whirl eh? the engine's a bit cold but hopefully we'll get a start Sounds nice. That'll do. Just take a look at this. There's no splits anywhere. As I say, it's literally like brand new. But um, I just thought, seeing as how they're all you know, all the bits off and that. It was probably the best thing to do it, just for peace of mind. Yeah, I like the Gates ones. The I think they're better than the Lotus ones, and I think they're better than the Continental, which seems to stretch after a few thousand miles. I think these are a great piece of kit, these. But look at that. Normally, if you just do this, you see like little splits going across it, and then it's not long before it finally gives way and snaps. But um, yeah, good old Tommy. Eh? He kept up his maintenance, he certainly did that. Good up. Thank you for watching this episode of Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And see you all next time.